one-stop, easy and elegant movie ratings experience. Stop wasting your time on bad movies and download the world's best movie ratings app from the iTunes App Store now. Hi everyone, this is Ahmed Karimli and welcome to Be Efficient TV. The mission of this web TV show is to boost the efficiency of your business and life pro tips and tricks from leading experts. And today I have with me John Kramer. He is a book marketing uh, expert and he is the owner of Open Horizons Publishing and he's also the author of 1001 Ways to Market Your Books. Welcome to the show, John. Thanks. Uh, I'm glad to be here. Uh, had a little trouble getting here, but I'm here. <laughs> Thank you for your time. So why and how you decided to become an author and uh, book marketing consult then book marketing consultant? Well, I've always wanted to be a writer ever since high school. So uh, at one point I decided, okay, I'm going to start. And I started by self-publishing a book and uh, very quickly found out that most of the people that were self-publishing at that time, this was back in 1984, uh, really didn't know what they were doing. And I knew at least some stuff about marketing. So I decided to write a book about marketing books. And, and uh, so from the beginning, like what's your background, uh, what did you study and uh, or from the beginning you just focused on, on uh, you know, be, becoming an, a writer? My college major was an interdisciplinary major in the study of anarchy, uh, which is basically the study of can society survive without a government. And I came to the conclusion that government is convenient. And how many so, books you wrote uh, before you, you decided to become a consultant in, in the book publishing and a publisher later? Well, I, I published two books and then I wrote the book on marketing books. And that uh, got me into consulting because people had additional questions. So I ended up having to become a consultant and coach in marketing because the demand was there. I wrote the book about marketing because I was helping a friend uh, market his uh, toy and gift company. And so I was doing everything from catalog marketing to premium marketing, uh, gift and retail shops and things like that. So I, I got a wide experience in helping him to set up his company. So that when it came to marketing books, while it wasn't perfect, uh, you know, they don't translate uh, perfectly, it was a good enough that I, I knew more about marketing than most people that were publishing books at the time. When you started like getting more into the internet marketing, uh, is it like when Amazon started and uh, and you are very, very advanced, like very up-to-date in what's going on in the internet world? Well, I started uh, marketing on the internet in 1994. That's when I created my website. Um, and, you know, th at that time, there were all these, uh, you know, it's America Online was the way that a lot of people got on uh, to the Internet. But I, f I created my own first website in 1994, and I've just grown from there. I now have, I think, around 40 websites, about 20 of them that are active right now. Why you blog or like you created different sites and you link them together? Uh, don't you think like focusing on one and putting on the content is is like more, I don't know. Uh, it's smarter. It, it's smarter, but uh, I just got, I have all these different interests and I wanted to keep them basically separated. So uh, I do have a catch-all website now called My Incredible Website. Um, and that's sort of my catch-all for all the things that I'm interested in now. And I'm slowly phasing out some of my websites and putting them into that website. My incredible website. Myincrediblewebsite.com. <laughs> so, can you take us step by step uh, in the process of how to plan the right launch uh, or marketing for for a, for a book, whether it's self-published or published? Either way, if you're going to launch a book, what you need are partners because you can't do it by yourself. You uh, you don't have enough people following you. Uh, there's very few authors who have more than 10,000 followers if they have that. And that's not enough to uh, sell very many books. 
you know, even if you have 30,000 people following you on Twitter, uh, that's small uh, in today's world. There was a time when if you had 30,000 followers on Twitter, there would be big publishers wanting to give you a contract, but that was like five years ago. Nowadays, you need partners. You need people that already are reaching the audience you want to reach, and they are willing to help you launch your book, uh, either because they're JV partners with you or they simply like you and your book. Uh, but you do need partners, people that will mail uh, to their customers, people that will interview you uh, either in a Skype uh, interview like this, a Google Hangout or, or uh, audio uh, teleconference interview, anything like that. Uh, you need to have partners that are going to blog about your book, uh, write about it, and so on. Um, I have a friend, uh, Joel Com. Uh, you might know him. Um, he wrote Twitter Power 3.0 that's coming out at the beginning of March. And he's already starting to marshal his forces to get all his friends and family to uh, market the book. And uh, I'm part of that launch. And you do need, you need a lot of people involved to make it happen well. You have two or three people involved, uh, even if they have great lists, it's probably not good enough to make you a bestseller. But uh, and certainly not good enough to sell 10,000 copies or something like that. Uh, so for that, you need a lot of partners. But how about like, okay. is that means <laughs> that for the people uh, who are just starting, means that they have to publish or self-publish three books until they build some following and some partners and they get well known in the market so they can reach, hit certain lists. Or there are there is some companies that you can recommend or you can work with them to do all of that for them, or there is cer certain services? I, I haven't found a company that I feel is good enough to do that. Uh, I do think that you don't have to have published a lot of books. You could start and launch one book, but you have to create some kind of visibility on the internet so you can create the, uh, you might know Tim Ferriss with the four hour work week. Uh, for the year prior to the launch of his book, he attended live a lot of internet marketing conferences and made friends with people. He took them out for drinks. He took them out for dinner. Uh, he got to know them. And his question for them was, how can I help you? And then, uh, you know, once he established some friendship with them and started helping them, then when he was ready to launch, he asked them, would you help me as well? And they were happy to help him because he had already been helping them. And he had a perfect topic for internet marketers. Work for four hours a week. You know, that's the dream of most internet marketers. Yeah, but how about like if someone will will go with a publisher? And um, is that only if he's very famous author, he can close a big publishing company so they can take care of most of these, these things and market uh, for him? And as well, he has to market as well and make relationship. Well, in, in today's world, every author has to be a marketer, whether they're published by a large publisher or they're using a print-on-demand publisher or simply publishing e-books. Uh, they still have to be the marketer because in today's world, the big publishers are, are lost. Uh, they don't know how to market a book unless the author is famous. And if the author isn't famous, uh, your book your book is going to get lost if you sell it to a, a big publisher. They're not going to know what to do with it. So they all, almost every publisher, even smaller publishers nowadays, keep asking the author one major question. What is your platform? Do you have an author platform? And a platform is simply a ready-made audience. Do you have people that love you, know you, and trust you so that they will... Uh, be eager to buy your book. Then it makes it easy for the publisher to uh, help you market that book. But if you don't have a ready-made audience, the publisher is going to take it to their normal audience and it's probably not going to be good enough for your book. But if I have a big following, why should I go publish with a publisher? Like I, I sell it and make more money with my, or just because of the credibility. What, what's your point, I mean, points or views The main on that? reason... 
yeah, the main reason you go with a big publisher is for credibility and uh, publicity. They're going to always get uh, more possibility of getting on a national TV show or something like that. It's very tough for a self-published author to get on the Today Show. It's been done, but it's tough. Um, whereas with a publisher, if they're supporting you, uh, they've got the connections, they've got the trust of the producers at the Today Show so that people will, uh, the Today Show producers would book the author. Uh, so what, you know, credibility and publicity and distribution. If your book needs to sell in bookstores, you're always going to have stronger distribution with a big publisher. The disadvantage of big publishers are they take a year to get your book out, uh, which for many of us in today's world, it's just too long to wait. Uh, the second thing is that, uh, you know, they don't, unless they've given you a lot of money up front, you know, in terms of an advance and, and royalties, they don't care about you. And, you know, you're going to care more about you. The other disadvantage, of course, is that you're going to get like 10% royalty if you're lucky. And, uh, and that's going to get paid, you know, six months or a year afterwards, uh, over and above anything you might have gotten uh, for the advance. So there's, you know, and then you give up con complete control of your book. I mean, you really are. Uh, I sold a book to a major New York publisher, and then my editor decided to become a forest ranger in Montana. And uh, you cannot sign with book. the publisher I, I, for for like one year or five years control, and then you take it back. Yes, they finally gave me the the rights back to that book. But I had originally self published that book, and I sold about ten thousand copies in six months. They sold ten thousand copies in about six years. And uh, you know, so I should have kept it. I would have made more money. So how about like the people who get publishers, but not the big five or big ten publishers? Like yeah, they should self-publish, yeah. you advise them? If they have the choice, like they have publisher, but he's not big and because they are new authors and they can self-publish. What would you it choose? Depends. Well, it depends on the publisher and how excited they are. For example, the, you know, there are some good uh, mid-sized publishers in the U.S., people like Sourcebooks, uh, Hay House, uh, New World Library. That if if they all, you know came to me and wanted to publish one of my books, I'd probably say yes, uh, because I know they're good publishers and I know they'll do a good job if they really want it. Um, but I'd probably still um, look for ways to build an additional product onto that book, so I have something to sell uh, going beyond the book, so that no matter what they do, no matter how much they screw up. I'm still going to have a product to sell. So use them for the book and use, let's say, make another course that you sell it on your site from the people right. that they will come to your site. Yes. Uh, and, you know, that's fairly easy to do in today's world. You know, if you've got a good book, you've got good content, it's easy to take that content and put it into a video course or into uh, some sort of membership site or into a live workshop. Uh, the way that I took a thousand and one ways to market your books and took it to something bigger is that I used to do uh, live uh, seminars that I would charge anywhere from one thousand to ten thousand dollars for. Do you recommend any service that or person that turns books into products, or do you do it yourself usually? I do it myself. I mean, it's so easy in today's world to. Uh, make the the videos that you would need to do and, and make whatever else you needed uh, You know the best kind of product I think to make in in today's world is is a good video product And you know, I don't know what you plan to do with this uh, Interview, but it's a core. I mean it, it becomes a basis for a product uh, You know, you've been interviewing a number of different people and you will have a product to sell at the end and you'll probably have created the relationships with a lot of potential JV partners to uh, sell that product at a good price and uh, to a lot of people. So 
how the what's open publishing uh, open horizons publishing like how it works like when you work with authors to to publish their books like uh, how much I royalty don't. you don't <laughs> so just for open, your own books open you use horizons it. is my company to publish me um and to publish me as a publisher uh you know i, I don't think of myself as a self-publisher i look for the best books to publish and they just happen to be written by me you recommended some mid-size uh, publishers. How about publishers uh, for ebooks or audiobooks? Do you recommend anyone or distributors? Well, I mean, if you're going to publish an ebook, you might as well do it yourself. There's, you know, you can t- publish direct to Kindle. Uh, that's really easy to set up and do. You can do it in about 20 minutes. Uh, then, if you want to, you can use uh, services like Smashwords or uh, Book Baby or Ingram Spark to uh, distribute that ebook into uh, other kinds of platforms. And then, if you wanted to do a print book at the same time, you can do that through, again, Ingram Spark or uh, I think Book Baby now has print on demand and there's Create Space that's owned by Amazon. And most of them are very low cost. The thing is, you go with any of those services, don't buy their marketing programs. That's where they make their money. They charge a thousand to three thousand to five thousand dollars for marketing programs that don't do anything. I mean, I'm embarrassed when I see what they, you know, they promise people uh, in their marketing programs and how poorly those uh, marketing programs perform for the authors that pay that money. To me, it's money thrown down the drain. It's much better for you to find people that actually know what they're doing to market if you're going to hire somebody to do it because you don't have the time. How to plan the right uh, giveaway campaign on Amazon? And do you recommend it before selling it uh, for a certain price on Amazon? Do you recommend to, to distribute it or to give it for free? I think giving it away for free is a good thing to do. It's a great strategy. It helps to get the book out there, gets the word of mouth going, which is, you know, word of mouth sells 80% of all books sold in the U.S. anyway. Uh, Somebody tells somebody else you need to buy this book. You know, word of mouth really does matter. And online, it's just as important as uh, person to person. People buy books because they're recommended by their friends. So get get your book into some people's hands so that you can start to get that word of mouth going. So doing a, you know, the Kindle Select program and giving away your book uh, for two or three days, I think it's a, a good strategy. If you're unknown, if you're known, if you've got a really strong platform, then don't give it away. Start selling it right away because you already got people hungry to buy the book. How to hit the Amazon number one? I see like most like self-published or even published, they go buy their own books to get like number one to say that we are best-selling authors. They get the best-selling author's title. Yes, most of the people that are doing that nowadays are not buying it themselves. They're asking friends and partners to do that. But unless a book is actually in the top 10 of all of Amazon, I don't think of it as an Amazon bestseller. So I don't like it when somebody says, well, I'm a bestseller because I hit number two in some sub, 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 sub category, category. which meant that you sold 50 books. Uh, That's not a bestseller. I I don't care what you say. Uh, It's okay. I mean, I know people are doing it, and uh, it certainly still has some credibility, you know, uh, among certain people, it has no credibility to me because I know the people that actually are, are best sellers on Amazon, and you know they, you know, Amazon tells me who they are. So if it's, uh, it has to be, let's say, a bestseller in the business category, which is a main category, then you consider it as a bestseller. I, I might in that case. I like you know the top ten or top one hundred in all of Amazon no matter what the category. I think that's the best uh, criteria for a bestseller. But if you wanted to take a really strong general category like business or cookbooks and say you're number one on Amazon or number two, that's fine with me. But when you get into those sub, 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 sub categories 
where basically you just pick a category that you know has no competition, and if you sell two books, you'll be a bestseller. And I mean, literally, I've seen people claim they're a bestseller on Amazon having sold fewer than 20 books. Well, they use it on, yeah. for marketing purposes. They put it on the, you know, on Facebook. I or know, on, uh, but the thing is that the credibility isn't there. I mean, the people that really know how Amazon works and how these Amazon bestseller campaigns work know that, you know, it's false, it's fake. You know, back in back about 10 years ago, they were people were doing Amazon bestseller campaigns where they were aiming to be number one or number two in all of Amazon. How and many books sell, required to be sold? They would sell for yeah. the 10,000. I know somebody that sold 20,000 copies through a campaign like that. Now, that's a bestseller. I mean, they sold those copies in one or two days. That, to me, is a bestseller. You know, and if they, the person that sold 4,000, uh, Mark Joyner, you might know him. Uh, he's an internet marketer. Oh. He sold 4,000 copies, again, in less than a day and hit number one or number two in all of Amazon. So it depends on when you're measuring it, uh, how many copies you have to sell. But it's somewhere probably between four and 10,000 copies to hit number one in Amazon for at least some period of time. Even if you give it give it away for free, let's say at that day, it will calculate that you are a bestseller or only if it's sold for money? Or how you plan that? You should give it for free for a while and then you set a launch well, I, date or how it I, works? I don't think that Amazon, uh, I might be wrong in this, but I don't think Amazon counts uh, giveaway copies in their bestseller ranking, at least not the top 100 or 1,000 books in all of Amazon. But... What that does do for you in, in terms of giving away the book is it increases your visibility in the category. So if somebody's looking for books on business, um, subcategory salesmanship, and you've given away a thousand copies, that's going to help increase your visibility in that category. Uh, so that when you do sell it, uh, more people will find it. So that's the main reason why you give the book away is to increase the visibility of your book uh, on Amazon with the algorithms that Amazon uses to uh, place books in, in different categories. And, you know, I think most of us know that if you don't, you know, if you're searching for salesmanship books or something like that, and, you know, you're going to buy one of the first 10 books you see. You're not going to go to the number 99th book. And that's why you have to have that visibility. How to hit the New York Times bestseller list uh, and how many books is required to sell it and can self-publishers, self-published books hit the New York Times or only published books? No, uh, I, I actually have uh, chronicled a number of different books that made it to the New York Times bestseller list as self-published books. Uh, including a, a children's book that outsold Harry Potter at the time, and Harry Potter was still selling. And it hit number one in children's books. Uh, it was actually a book published by a friend of mine. Uh, boy, but I'm going blank on the title right now. <laughs> but there are a lot of self-published books that have hit the New York Times list. Um, over time sometimes, sometimes it was because they did a good launch strategy, other times because, uh, you know, some other factor. But the thing is, with New York Times bestsellers, you've got to have bookstore distribution and uh, sell books through the bookstores or you'll never hit the New York Times list. Because New York Times does count Amazon sales, but they discount those sales. I mean, if all your sales are through Amazon, uh, they're not going to count uh, all those Amazon sales when there's another book that's selling as many copies or even less through the bookstores that New York Times uh, surveys to find out what books are selling well. How the survey work? Like how many copies they need within a day or within a week and, uh, and how it should be it, distributed over the bookstores? It's, it's measured, uh, New York Times measures sales by the week. Uh, I believe it's from, well, I can't remember now. I think it's from uh, Friday to Friday, but it, it might be Saturday to Saturday. Um, and they're looking for sales in the outlets that they actually survey. And they don't survey every bookstore in the country. They survey a, 
about 100 or 200 bookstores in the country, plus the top internet retailers and the top wholesalers. And then they use uh, their own algorithm to decide uh, what the value is for each bookstore sell. For example, they value the books that are sold in East Coast, East Coast uh, bookstores more valuable than books sold in Oklahoma or Colorado or Texas. They also value the books that are sold in the West Coast more than the books that are sold uh, in Alabama, Tennessee, Michigan, or something like that. So they actually, you know, sort of uh, manipulate the numbers <laughs> in a real way uh, to pick out the books that they really want to be bestsellers. I mean, it's the New York Times bestseller list in some ways is a work of fiction. So they change all the time. You don't know exactly how, how they do it. And there are actually, well, it, I've, 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 I know some services that some authors pay them $50,000, $30,000, and, and they make them hit the New York Times. They buy for them the books in different places, and, and they make them hit the, the list. Right. Uh, but, uh, you know, the minute New York Times finds out that anybody's doing that kind of activity, mm -hmm. that book is gone. So you don't uh, recommend and that, that author. Th that author is gone. They will never see the New York Times list again. Um, I did something like that uh, when uh, with Deepak Chopra's first book. Uh, they came to me and I told them, "Here, you need to have people buy a lot of books in these particular bookstores." And so we channeled something like uh, ten thousand copies bought in these particular bookstores that I identified and uh, his book hit the New York Times bestseller list. Okay. But we actually had individuals buying the books, so there were 10,000 individuals who were buying the books. We just channeled those sales through bookstores that I knew were reporting to the New York Times list. Which, which stores, let's say top five stores that, that you think are the most important stores? Well, you or know, still changing. Uh, now. The, the, it changes some, but you know, if if you hit the top, uh, you know, uh, three or four good bookstores in New York City, uh, Politics and Prose in Washington D.C., uh, Tattered Cover in Denver, uh, some of the good bookstores on the West Coast, uh, you'll be pretty well off with that. Uh, you know, so th it's not that hard to identify what some of the key bookstores are that would make a difference. And we, we actually went to five different bookstores. We actually channeled those 10,000 orders into five different bookstores. I don't remember which ones they were now at this time because that was again, uh, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago. How the Wall Street list work and which one is more important, the New York Times or the Wall Street best-selling list? Well, Wall Street is really important for books. Uh, I mean, business books, but it's not, it's not of any value for fiction or something like that. The New York Times list is a more important list because when bookstores uh, feature best-selling books in the front of their store, it's always the New York Times best-selling books. It's not somebody else's list. Even business. So in business, even, even yeah, New York Times is more important. Yes, for th that particular reason. Uh, because of how the stores use the New York Times list, they feel that that's the best list out there, and it probably is. But uh, boy, it's it really is a work of fiction. Uh, so the Wall I, St I, Wall Street also they have certain algorithm that they change all the time based on the bookstores or a survey or or how it works, like the no, New York I think Times. The, I think the Wall Street Journal basically just uses sales in certain outlets. Uh, I don't know which ones they actually measure, but uh, you know they're going to go to even to uh, there's a bookseller uh, that sells by phone 800 CEO Read, which is very influential when it comes to business books, and uh, I know that the uh, Business Week uh, Bloomberg Business Week uh, bestseller list, and I'm pretty sure the Wall Street bestseller list uh, relies on that uh, as much as. Uh, sales and bookstores for business books. What's the book marketing network? 
The Book Marketing Network is a network that I created and now has almost 8,000 members uh, or 9,000, somewhere in there. Um, and it's just designed to, for authors to work together to sell books, each other's books. Uh, the reality is it's... Uh, so it's like authors, a forum? It, it's, it's a social network. Uh, it has forums there. It has a blogging capability, video sharing capability. It has lots of different capabilities. But quite honestly, you know, some authors are using it pretty well. But most authors come in, you know, create a profile, and I never see them again. So they, how they can register or sign up? It's a free, it's a membership? It's a free, uh, it's free to sign up. Uh, I have to approve you because uh, if you leave it open membership, then you get so many spammers coming in and it, it, you know, it destroys the network. So I have to approve everybody to make sure they're actually authors and not, uh, you know, fancy ladies looking for a nice guy to, uh, you know, marry, you know, <laughs> things like that. Uh, and I get that all the time. I mean, I get, you know, spammers trying to get in the network, but I, I can recognize them and I, you know, I decline membership. If I didn't do that, the membership would be much larger, but it wouldn't be useful at all. Um, it's not, you know, I still, I'm sort of disappointed that more authors don't work with each other to sell books. Like, if I were a fantasy author, the first thing I would do is find, make good friends with like 10 other or 20 other fantasy authors and make a pact that every time I promote my book, I also promote their books. And, and, you know, and do something like that because one author working by themselves can only reach so many people and can only do so much stuff. But if there are 10 authors promoting each other, uh, you could really expand your audience and expand the people that would find out about your book. And the thing is, is that if you like, you know, if I write fantasy novels, let's say, and and I find five other authors that write books just like mine and I love their books, I'm going to pro promote the heck out of those books as well because I know that they will love my book and do the same for me. The problem is that uh, marketing or promoting a book is getting more complicated and more easier with the technology because there's so many things to do, like to think about people to interview, to think about partners, to think about social media. Think about Amazon and ebooks and audiobooks and and it's just yeah. overwhelming. Like regardless how advanced you are, it keeps changing. Yeah, and it keeps the thing is that you have to focus. You really do. If you're going to do social networking, pick one or two and work them hard. Uh, so if you like doing Facebook, do Facebook. If you like Twitter, do Twitter. I like Pinterest. Uh, I have the best results from Pinterest. And uh, so that's the one that I get the most traffic from. It really does drive traffic very well. And so I like that one. But uh, I'm hoping to do more with YouTube because I'm planning to do more with video uh, coming up. It's something that I've been sort of backward on in the sense that I haven't produced that many videos so far. But video marketing is still probably one of the best tools you have out there to uh, market anything. And I, I think, you know, so I need to know, you know, understand that market better and use it more. So lots of women likes you on Pinterest means. It's A like, lot what? Like it means lots of women liking you on Pinterest because it's more like women likes to use it a lot. And even there are some uh, people saying that now Instagram is taking over over Pinterest and it's going down or still it's doing well for you. No, Pinterest is still doing very, very well, and it's it's actually better designed than in, uh, Instagram for uh, viral uh, repinning and so on. I mean, I've pinned some pins of mine. I have one pin that's had over 1.5 million repins, and uh, I pinned it two years ago, and it's still driving. I just checked on my website. That one image is still driving 125 people to my website now, two years after it was originally pinned. Well, wow. okay. And, and, yeah. and Pinterest does that. It, you know, I have about 20 pins that I've done that have really driven traffic. Uh, you know, so I get 
uh, to this one website where these especially uh, drive. Um, I'm getting right now around 700 to 800 people every day to my website. 80% uh, of that coming from Pinterest. How to create a superstar blog tour for authors? And why authors should make a blog or should blog? The main reason you should blog is that uh, all the search engines love fresh content. And if you're not blogging, you're not going to be creating new content for your website. So if you blog once or twice a week, you're going to be creating new content on a regular basis for your website. That means that your search engine visibility and organic you know, people finding you uh, will be enhanced. Um, What's your views on SEO now with all these changes and like um, link backlinking and it's not working as before? Only they need it, 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 fresh, fresh content all the time. You do. I, I believe you need fresh content and it's got to be good content. It's very hard to create good content when you're uh, automating the curation of that content. Um, I've seen so many curation programs and some of them are very good. But they're never as good as somebody who's handpicking something and recommending it. Um, you just don't get the same kind of interaction with the search engines or with the people that actually come to your website. And I think you need that. So, uh, you know, I've bought a number of those auto curation programs, but I haven't used them because I don't think they do a good enough job. How authors should design their cover uh, and like in terms of title, subtitle, and do you recommend any designing uh, services for specialized in books? I do. I, I actually have a whole listing of them on my website, uh, book cover designers, uh, and I recommend a number of them as being really good. I The one thing in publishing a book that I generally speaking tell authors not to do is design their own cover. Uh, because you can tell, and and even the unsophisticated readers can tell the difference between a well-designed cover and one that was good enough. Do you recommend? And, uh, yeah, sorry. And I think that book titles are really important. I I think that book titles have to be memorable, and I I I like them to be also brandable so that you own the title uh, so your website uh, URL can be the title of your book and things like that or some variation of that uh, and that's one thing that I do I help authors come up with a good memorable brandable title and I actually charge too little for that service right now I, I charge $125 which is way too cheap I'm gonna have to increase that price just title uh, if, and subtitle. You recommend <laughs> title and subtitle for them. I, I help them come up with the title and a subtitle that I believe will help them sell the book. I've I've sat on a lot of panels in different conferences and so on with top book buyers from wholesalers and bookstores and top media people, producers at top New York shows, and I I watch them and I see them pick up a book and instantly decide, without opening the book whether or not to do anything more with that book. So they're, they're going sorting like this. I mean, you know, a top TV show is going to get 200 books a day. And they're going to, if, if you're lucky, they're going to pick three authors in a week. So that means they're going to be picking three books out of a thousand books in that week to feature those authors in, on their show. And, you know, those odds aren't that great. But, you know, so the first thing that those producers are doing is sorting the books out. And if they don't look professional, uh, that book is put into a different pile right away. Um, the second thing is if that book doesn't have good bookstore distribution, it's probably going to get pushed to the side. Um, there are exceptions to that. Every once in a while, a major TV show will uh, take an author who maybe just has ebooks on Amazon, but uh, that's very rare. They want to promote books that are in bookstores. So, how to be featured in the media as author efficiently? 
the key thing w with media is they want a good story. Uh, so th then they're not, if you're not famous, they're not interested in interviewing you because you're an author. They're interested in interviewing you because you got a good story to tell. You got some good advice to share. You've got something that will service their audience and they want to share that. So, you know, uh, major TV shows uh, like Today's Show and Good Morning America, they like cookbook authors because cookbook authors can come on the show and demonstrate some cooking thing and, and feed them, you know, <laughs> they like that. Uh, so cookbooks are easy to do. Uh, business books are a little bit tougher. Uh, so you have to have something unusual, something interesting. You have to have a one of the best ways, I think, to get on national TV, uh, at least in the United States, is um, to tie into a news story that's already happening. So, uh, you know, I don't know what... The and usually you pitch them through press releases or how to pitch the media? Uh, press releases or faxes uh, or emails. Uh, a lot of uh, media people are email savvy and will do it that way. And if you're following them on Twitter, you could possibly tweet them uh, a little pitch. Uh, but ultimately, uh, they're not going to decide until they talk to you on the phone. If they like the news release that you send them uh, or the query letter that you send them, they will pick up the phone and call you within minutes of seeing what you have to offer. Uh, I, I you don't have to wait. You don't have to guess if, if they're interested or not, because if they are, they're going to pick up the phone. I ask you about the editing process. Do you recommend authors to use different editors for each of their books or use one editor? I, I think it's fine. If you like the editor that you had for the first book, use him for the next one. Uh, I see nothing wrong with that as long as the editor is good. Um, but you need a professional e editor. You can't use, you know, your high school English teacher or even your college English teacher. Uh, you certainly can't use a journalist uh, because they, their style of writing is different than that of writing a book. You have a list on your uh, site as well for editors that you recommend, yeah, right? I do. I do. Uh, I have a list of editors there as well. Over time, I've created different lists to help people uh, publish more readily. So I have a list of cover designers, a list of, and a list of uh, editors and ghostwriters, uh, and then of course a list of book printers and a list of uh, ebook services. So you know those are some of the lists that I have there because somebody's got to have the list. <laughs> How much so usually they charge them. those services for, let's say, a book design or even for the editing, like per word or uh, depends on like just a project, they quote you one price. In average, those services it, that you recommend. It will be, editing is usually going to cost you about $1,000 for a 200-page book. Um, it, again, it could be a little bit less or more depending on who you hire, but if you're hiring a professional, it's probably going to be at least a thousand dollars. A cover designer, a really good one, is going to cost you two to three thousand dollars. But the neat thing is that there are some, you know, there are some good services out there now. You know, things like even Fiverr, where you could possibly end up with a good cover, as long as you have enough judgment to tell if it's a good cover or not. And uh, if you're in doubt about whether or not the cover de design that you have is good. Take it to the local bookstore, you know, a good independent bookstore, uh, and ask them to tell you if it's a good cover. They'll be brutally honest with you. Uh, like one thousand dollar for two two hundred pages, is it like one cent per word, approximate? Because it's like it's a very low price, or it's just editing without any developmental uh, work for the editor on the book. Yeah, I'm, I'm talking, if they're doing a thousand for a 200 page book, they're doing copy editing, they're not doing developmental editing. If and you want developmental editing, which is really working with you to make the book the best it can be, it's probably going to cost you closer to three to five thousand dollars. And I do know ghostwriters that charge fifty thousand dollars based on their style of writing? Uh, you know, the ghostwriter is that, you know, almost any best-selling book by a politician has been ghostwritten. 
almost every best-selling book by a businessman has been ghostwritten. Uh, there's some ghostwriter behind it. It doesn't mean it's not their, you know, the politician or businessman's words, but there's a ghostwriter that's shaped it and made it into something, you know, actually readable. What's your views about the the codes and ISBN and how to use them correctly? Like you should buy your own or use the Amazon one when you are self publishing and when you are publishing. What's your advice in that? I think that if you're publishing printed books, you should have your own set of ISBN numbers uh, that you can assign to the book that's printed. But if you're use, you know, I mean, obviously eBooks. You don't assign ISBNs to uh, Amazon automatically signs its own code to it if you upload it to Kindle. Uh, and I think that's fine. Uh, all you want is an identifying code that's, that's unique to that format of that book. Now, if you're going to sell your book into a lot of other ebook markets, if they don't provide you with a, you know, a clear code, then you'd, you'd want to assign an ISBN number to that. Um, but the ISBN number identifies a specific book in a specific format for that book. How authors can pitch themselves if they are self-published the bookstores? Well, the way that I recommend it is that you form a publishing company and you act as the publisher and you book your author into bookstores and so on as the publisher. Uh, so in many cases, what I do is I invent a new name uh, for myself as the publisher, if I'm, you know, or something like that. Or I had a friend that I could use his name as my vice president of marketing, and he said it was fine to use his name. So he was my vice president of marketing for many years. That's Never fine. showed up for work. <laughs> <laughs> How about book signing? The same thing as a publisher, you pitch the bookstore. Do you tell them that? There is an author, and uh, we want to do and book a book signing uh, yeah, today. Yeah, but what I I actually would never book a book signing. I would book a talk, where I then sign afterwards. Yeah, you gather people. Yeah, you have to get people involved. If you're not well known, if you're well known, you can just sit there at the table, and people will come up and want to get your autograph. But if you're not well known, you've got to create a relationship with the people first. So if you can give a 20-minute talk, that's going to make a lot of difference. That's right. And uh, but I have a friend uh, who self-published a number of novels, and uh, he goes into Costco, and uh, I believe he does it at Sam's Club too. Uh, we'll go into those stores and sit down at the table and uh, just engage people as they're walking by. <laughs> and he sold, uh, I think he sold up to 200 books that way in a day. That's great. And he has fun. He loves doing it. And uh, he's got a good relationship with a wholesaler to the Costco so that uh, he lives uh, in Alaska during the summer and in Palm Springs, California in the winter so he does uh so he, do, he does a talk like how, how he engaged them like he goes give a talk <laughs> excuse me no he uh thing. he sits there at the table and he just as people walk by he says hey i'm a you know i'm author of this new book i hope you'll take a look at it and i'd be happy to autograph it if you buy it hmm. and, and you know he's a friendly guy so he gets and he loves talking to people, so he just engages in that way, and a lot of people will buy a book uh, if it's from a direct from the author. Uh, people like to autograph. You know, I met this author and I got his autograph. You know, uh, how are you? So, uh, yeah. uh, he actually uh, wrote a novel about Nebraska, which is you know in the middle of the United States, and he did a Nebraska tour for ten days. And he sold 700 books during that 10 days, which is a lot more books than the typical author sells in a year. Wow. I want to ask you about your one-on-one -on -one as a consultant, how it works, yeah. how your courses work. Uh, do you take over a certain, pro, uh, let's say, book and you, you'll be responsible for launching it or marketing it or you just work as a consultant? I primarily work as a consultant. There. 
I have right now one client that I'm helping with a launch, uh, and I'm not ready to take on a second client because uh, I'm not charging him enough. <laughs> and so it's hard for me to find the time to do as much as I should for him. Uh, so I, I don't think I want to take on a second client at this time. Now, what I probably should do at some point is hire some young 20-year-olds 20, 20 and teach them uh, what I know and uh, supervise them and, you know, charge uh, five or $10,000 a month to, you know, launch sure. a book for somebody. You don't have, be like, a team online working with you? Or I offline? don't. I don't. And, and I would want... I could probably do it with virtual assistants, uh, but I would want to sit down live with them for at least two to three weeks to train them in the thought process of what to do, what to look for, how to uh, how to engage your partnerships and things like that to launch a book. Like usually, how long it takes when you help an author, and uh, like how long it takes to to launch it or prepare well, a marketing what I'm doing, plan. What I'm doing with this one author is that uh, it's six months before the launch. Six months before the launch. Because, you know, I had to start by uh, making his website a lot better, uh, you know, so that it was findable and uh, create social networking profiles for him. And then the next step is to start to create the relationships with potential joint venture partners. So you prepare and, a form uh, for him and you pitch it by email to those joint venture partners or how you do it? Uh, I do, uh, but it, you know, it's a, it's a strategy, you know, you're really creating a relationship. So part of that is, is that I am, as him, uh, starting to comment on potential partners, comment on their blog post or something like that. So that when I actually pitch them for something, they already will recognize my name because they've been interacting with me in the social networks or they've been interacting with me on their own blogs or videos or something like that. So that when I come to them, they're already ready to do something because they will recognize, in this case, his name because I'm you know, working under his name. So you you comment using but, his, but his I, you know I want you know I think it takes about six months to nourish relationships to the point that you know on the on that one day or that one week you'll be able to start to actually launch the book um, using you know one of the different techniques the superstar blog tours uh, the product launches that Jeff Walker teaches or some other variation of that where you get you know, a lot of people involved in helping you to market your book. How much would you are, charge your you next know, client for the six months? How much, this one? This one or the next one, how, would, how much? This uh, one I'm charging 3,000 a month, but it's, it's too low. Uh, I really should be charging more uh, because uh, it really does take time to nourish and, you know, and if you're going to justify spending the time, the you know three thousand a month is essentially one hour a day for twenty days of my time. Right. Do you recommend? And even any- then, it, it, even then, it's cheap because that's like a hundred fifty an hour, but I charge six hundred an hour for consulting. Uh, do you recommend any book trailers uh, services? I. I I don't I don't know I haven't seen that they really work uh, I think they can work I think that if somebody really does something interesting uh, it could work I, I have seen one or two things uh, videos that I thought were well done uh, I think one of the uh, novelists uh, John Green I think his name is he did a nice uh, semi book trailer uh, Tim Ferriss has done a, a nice book trailer at one point. But most of the book trailers I see are... Have you worked with Tim Ferriss before? And who is the most uh, famous author that you worked with? Well, Deepak Chopra, Jack Canfield, Mark Victor Hansen. Um, Mainly as a consultant? 
yeah, Robert Allen, uh, a consultant or something like that. Yes, uh, with Deepak, I, you know, did the bookstore strategy to get his book on the New York Times bestseller list. Um, with Jack and Mark, I I didn't do that much direct work with them. With Robert Allen, I did. Um, other, you know, there's been other people that I've worked with like that, but. Uh, what I really enjoy most doing is actually consulting with people, helping to give them in one hour uh, the basic strategy of what they should be doing, the top five things they should be doing to market their book, and then let them focus on that. Uh, in most cases, people shouldn't be doing more than five things to market their books. One of them might be that they, you know, they're really trying to get on national TV. That would be one thing. And uh, then you'd be pitching a number of different national TV shows. And uh, you have to do it in the right way, things like that. Uh, you can really ruin credibility with a national TV show very quickly if you don't do it in the right way. What are the other four things that you prefer personally? Like if you would, you do it, you, you would do it for your book? I think you need to do some sort of internet launch. I think that that's important. Exactly what what format that takes uh, depends on what you're good at doing. Uh, I think that for most authors, they need to get out there and do a certain amount of speaking, either live or uh, things like what we're doing now. Uh, essentially, we're be I'm being interviewed by you, and that's part of... Uh, uh, speaking uh, in this sense being interviewed I think that you need to do that because if people hear you speak they're much more likely to tell other people about your book than, than if they simply read your book I think that if your book can sell through bookstores you should really work hard to create relationships with bookstores and that, that's one reason I sell a list of the top 700 uh, bookstores in the United States uh, to encourage authors to start to develop relationships uh, with those bookstores because I think that's important. Um, I think you have to have an active good website with a blog attached to it and part of that you know one of the values of a blog is that with a blog you can start to create relationships with other people online because they might say interview you then you could turn around and say I'd like to interview you and at some point I'm, I'll probably do that with you and uh, you know say hey you know when you're ready to launch a product I want to interview you so that I can help you sell your product right. something like that um, and I'm sure you know you're doing one of the smartest things that anybody that wants to market online can do, and that's to interview uh, a lot of smart people. Thank you. And uh, you know the, the, that's you know that's the first step in a good internet marketer is to start building those relationships, because you ask good questions. You know, I like you. I can tell that already. <laughs> uh, Thank I you. don't know if I'll ever visit you because I don't know if I'll ever make it to Dubai. But, uh, you know. I'll be delighted uh, to have you here. I will tour you in the city and we will have a good time. Just come. I know. It's a, it's a beautiful city, so I wouldn't mind going at some point. But, you know, it, it's that relationship is important and you're doing that already. So you're already a great model for what every author should be doing. Thank you. I want to ask you about your uh, daily life and work routine. Uh, like what you do when you wake up in the morning till you until you sleep, and when which day which time of the day you prefer to write? I like working at night. You know, obviously it's one o'clock your time. It's almost three o'clock my time. Uh, in the morning, you know, it's three a.m. Um, I do my best work between uh, midnight and five a.m. And I like it because normally I'm, it's quiet. I don't get yeah. phone calls, anything like that. But uh, I generally, if I'm working until 5 or 6 in the morning, I'm getting up around noon 
and then I'll spend time with my wife and making breakfast and all that and walking my dogs and uh, then if I have to go into town do those errands so somewhere around four or five o'clock I will from four to eight I'll, I'll work some more and then you know and during four to eight I'm doing returning phone calls and things like that and PM, uh, four to eight p.m. 4 to 8 p.m., yeah, mm. and uh, handling email and stuff like that. Then from 8 to uh, about 11, uh, again, I'm spending time with my wife and dogs and eating dinner and things like that. Um, but again, the, it varies depending on what you know I have because I will often have consulting appointments at 1 o'clock or noon or something like that, in which case you know my, I have to change my schedule around. But and then I'm doing webinars because I have a course on how to make money and market via Pinterest, and so I'm doing a, at least one webinar a week for that, uh, and right. selling that. So, you know, I, it, I used to be like you, like uh, try more, like I'm more productive in the evening between one to five a.m. But the problem is, and yeah. it's quiet, no one calls you. But the problem when you, even if you sleep eight hours at, from five a.m until noon you don't feel very tired or depressed sometimes that's why I'm, I tried to shift it like wake up at 5 a.m. or 6 a.m. instead I don't know I just found that night was my time uh, I think I was born at night and I, <laughs> I think <laughs> it, it, it's the time I like you know it's quiet it is. my wife's not going to interrupt me during the day, she feels like she can call me at any time and ask for something. You know, <laughs> it's not like I go to an office, you know, and, and so on. Although I have built a small office here, uh, you know, 200 feet from our house, so I'm away uh, in this little cubicle, you could say, and I like it now. It's it's a nice thing to have, um, but I think you have to find what works for you. I know. My wife, she's an early getter-upper. She likes that. If she was going to work, she would want to do it in the morning. And uh, I've tried that, but it just doesn't work for me. So I just gave up trying to do that, and I live the way that I live. But I make sure I take care of myself. I make sure I spend time with my wife and my dogs. And, you know, we live uh, on the side of a mountain, so... Uh, the minute I walk out my door, I'm among the forest, you know, and walking in a nice, beautiful area. So it's a, it's an easy way for me to do it. I could not live in a city. Uh, you know, I don't mind visiting the city, but it, I couldn't live in a city. Very crowded and noisy. How about your softwares and uh, the things that makes you more efficient that you like to use? Well... In, in today's world, I'd say the word, software I use the most is WordPress because I'm always updating and changing my websites. Uh, my old legacy website is still uh, created page by page, and at some point I have to switch it over to WordPress because with WordPress, Easy. there's so much more stuff you can do with a website to make it rich and interactive and uh, easy to change the look and feel of it uh, as it is now. My my old key website, bookmarket.com, has right now three different look and feels because I haven't changed every page. And it's some, you know, right now, you know, I don't want to. I'm uh, taking some of the content and putting it over to a WordPress site, bookmarketingbestsellers.com. And uh, I'm probably going to do that over time. Just take most of the content and transfer it to a WordPress site. Uh, rather than try to recreate my bookmarket.com website as a WordPress site, because it's already got something like 2,000 pages on it, uh, it's not a simple deal to, you know, transfer it over. And I don't like the sort of automated solutions that some people have proposed to me because you still have to go and look at each page and make sure it's saying what you want and looking the way you want it to. What are your other hobbies? My other hobbies, uh, I love just writing. So uh, writing and reading are my main hobbies and then of course walking my dog. I don't have any other, I don't think I have any other hobbies than that. 
Your top but three mentors. I, I walk, uh, you know, I walk at least an hour a day with my dogs, and uh, you know, I read a lot. I, I love reading. Uh, I love magazines. I, lo I read a lot of magazines. I love browsing on the internet, uh, things like that. Uh, but I don't have any other special hobbies or collections. Well, well except for I, I collect uh, optical illusions. Who are your top three mentors? I was, for the most part, self-taught. There are a lot of people that I really like and respect and I keep learning from. People like Jeff Walker and Joel Kahn, Jack Canfield and Mark Victor Hansen, uh, Rick Frischman, uh, um I'm going blank at some of the other names right now. But there's a, you know, I love going at least, I try to go at least every other month or so to a live event so I can reconnect with people that I know and love and, and actually just talk to them and learn more from them. Um, but when I started off on the internet, I was basically learning on my own how to design a website and how to start to market it. But I had already, by the time the internet came around, I was already you know, 10 years into marketing books uh, in the real world. In advance. And, uh, and I fell in love with the internet because the internet gave all of us as authors worldwide exposure. And when I first started uh, seeing the internet, I said, hey, you got to get on the internet for no other reason than the possibility of, you know, really making friends with people all over the world. And, you know, a lot of my social media followers are from other places around the world. Which uh, social media uh, you prefer the most other than Pinterest, like uh, Twitter or Facebook? Which one you are more comfortable with? I like Facebook the best. I, I, I like Twitter because it's very efficient. You know, you only got 100, 140 characters. You can't do more than that. So I design my blog post so that when people come to it, they can easily tweet my blog post or share it uh, very quickly and uh, so I use all three of those actively I use Google Plus also but not as actively and uh, I should use LinkedIn more but I don't uh, because you only have so much time in the day you can't do them all well so uh, Facebook and Pinterest are my two primary focuses uh, you and, use, a, use a tool called Buffer. I use it uh, to schedule uh, the, the post, like like one post you post it on Buffer and then you already program it to post, let's say, on, on LinkedIn at a certain time and Facebook at another time or another day automatically. So you save more time. Yeah, and I do have some of that automated. And obviously with, a, with WordPress websites, you can actually, when you post a blog post, automatically have it sent off to all your social networks if you want to i like to customize them i you know i do it by it's hand it's more uh, effective yeah it's uh, it's, it's get more engagement usually when you customize yeah, it for each it, yeah and so they look different and they feel different and things like that but uh you know you, you have a limited amount of time and you have oh. to decide how best you're going to use it uh but i think creating relationships are important and I think the main reason to be on any social network is to create relationships uh, with other people that are on those networks. Um, Facebook is good for that. Twitter can be good for that. Pinterest, I'm, you know, isn't that good at creating relationships, but it's incredibly good at sending traffic. If you have the chance to advise your younger self, what would you advise your younger self? <laughs> get a job <laughs> <laughs> really oh I, I would probably uh, I would say buy Apple <laughs> <laughs> uh, if, if I were telling my younger self let's say in college I would have probably told myself get into computer programming because you know that's where you can really make the money. I mean, you know, writing books is, you know, you don't make the kind of money a good programmer that invents Facebook does, you know. 
or the guy that did WhatsApp and got $19 billion. I mean, you know, there's no book author that's made more than a billion dollars, you know, on that. That's Harry Potter, you know. <laughs> uh, so I would have probably said get into computers, you know, uh, more and actually learn how to program. Because if I had started to learn how to program back in 1986 or 7 when I started using computers, uh, you know. Yeah, that time it gives you an edge, but now it's different. Now it's even... It's it's not the problem the programmers because you can hire so many people for very you can few, hire them you know. but at that time yeah. yes it was a, an edge that you know and uh, most of the people in the world don't know so the people also changing every two twenty years you have a different you know yeah uh, different but thing I, I probably would have said take a little bit more time to see if you can sell the rights to your book before you self publish uh, that's what I would have said thirty years ago. In today's world, I, I probably would advise most authors to actually self-publish. Get it out there and start the market. But, uh, you know, start building the audience. When you have the idea for the book, start to actually build the audience for your book then. So, so you are with more, more with the self-publishing. Now, if you have a book, you prefer to self-publish it than going with I, the publisher. I think it, it, it's so much quicker. I mean... You know, you can actually write a book in, in five or ten days if you want to, and, and boom, you have the book out. But, you know, I, I see so many people take a year or two to write a book and then sell it to a publisher that's going to take another year or two to publish it. And, uh, you know, I'm too impatient for that. Uh, actually, in today's world, I would tell people, don't write books, create products. You right. know, Create a video product, create a membership site, create something like that. Use your book as a lead into that, as something that uh, you know builds up your audience and your credibility. But uh, you're going to make a lot more money selling a good high-end product than you are selling books. What are your um, top for fav- top three favorite books? Probably Walden by Henry David Thoreau. Um, I love Leaves of Grass by Walt Whitman, and uh, that's a fiction book. No, it's poetry. Okay, from uh, around eighteen fifty to eighteen eighty, uh, his Song of Myself is an incredible poem. I love it. Uh, and then I'd probably say Heinlein's uh, novels, Robert Heinlein. Top three people that you are inspired by. Uh, people that I love, like Jack Canfield, Mark Victor Hansen, uh, Joe Com, uh, those those guys, they keep inspiring me. What makes you really happy? <laughs> Having time to do whatever I want, and uh, fortunately, I can do that. And I've been able to do it for thirty years. I've supported myself in writing and publishing books, and. Uh, I learned how to market on the internet when that came along, and uh, I'm enjoying that, and and I get to set my own schedule. So it, one day, if I want to work from 8 in the morning to 12 at noon, I can. Uh, of course, that means I have to go to bed earlier or stay up all night. <laughs> <laughs> I, love, I love my dogs. I love my wife. I love living where I live. And I love spending time outdoors. Uh, we have great places to walk around here, and and I I enjoy that. Uh, Last question: How people can contact you? Uh, they can contact me by uh, going to Facebook if they want. Facebook.com slash John Kramer, or BookMarketingBestsellers.com, which is my active blog and website right now. Uh, they can also go to bookmarket.com and uh, email me that way, uh, John Kramer at bookmarket.com. Any of those tools will work. Or if you just scream into your <laughs> into your computer, uh, maybe I'll hear you. <laughs> Thank you so much, John, for the really the Thanks valuable so information. Really appreciate it and appreciate your yeah. time. Thank yeah, you so much. So Thanks everyone, be efficient and stay efficient and see you soon with another leading expert.